The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Good evening and welcome to the property edition of Your Money, Your Call. I'm Michael Tees, filling in for your regular host, Margaret Lomas. An Australian Securities and Investments Commission report warns that some retirement incomes are at risk from property spruikers urging ill-suited investors to start a DIY super fund and borrow to invest in real estate inside the fund. ASIC says, in the right hands, self-managed super funds can be very effective vehicles for retirement saving. In the wrong hands, however, self-managed super funds can be high risk. ASIC Com Commissioner Peter Kell says, we do not want to see self-managed super funds become the vehicle of choice for property spruikers. Where we see examples of unlicensed superannuation fund advice or misleading marketing, we will be taking regulatory action. The emergence of property spruikers touting the tax advantages of holding property inside a self-managed super fund comes as the restrictions on borrowings to invest in real estate through these funds has been relaxed over recent years. The ASIC review focused on investor files where there was a balance of 150000 or less and included older members, members with low income and investments in a single asset class, i.e. property. ASIC found a number of issues with pockets of advice in these cases including suitable alternatives not being considered and there were inadequate considerations of the investors' long-term retirement planning objectives. In other property investing news, a Biz Shrapnel report says demand for apartments could slow in favour of houses as the 20 to 34-year-old segment of the population move on to the next stage of their lives. According to the Emerging Trends in Residential Market Demand report, this age bracket of 20 to 34-year-old has been driving apartment occupancy for the last 10 years. At the same time, Biz Shrapnel finds there has not been any major evidence of an increasing in the rate of downsizing by those aged 65 and over. The author of the report, Angie Zigomanis, is reported by PropertyObserver.com as saying, assuming the current 20 to 34 year olds in multi-unit dwellings move on to separate houses, as has already been evident among 35 to 49 year olds, then this will translate to higher demand for new detached housing. But Biz Shrapnel does propose an alternative future where apartment dwellers grow to like living in apartments and don't move on to houses, which will see a demand for apartments with appropriate indoor and outdoor spaces for young families. Tonight, Peter Kalousas from The Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT join me on the desk to discuss these stories and to answer your calls. If you have any questions for us this evening, you can call us right now on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at property at skynews.com.au. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Well, we see for the first time, perhaps in a long time, a little bit of bad news perhaps for the unit market with suggestions that the demand might not be ever increasing as we've been led to believe in recent times. What are your thoughts on that, Peter? Um, well, the assumption is that these echo baby boomers are going to have children or lots of children, uh, as their parents did, and I think the jury's still out on that. I think there will be still uh, demand for apartments, uh, but we need to wait to see are, are these echo baby boomers just delaying when they're going to have children, or are they not going to have children at all? Because if they do have children, then obviously the tend is towards yeah. to move to houses. Yeah. And um, Brad, you're probably one of those echo baby boomers, perhaps the only one on the panel tonight. Um, what, what are your thoughts then? I think uh, the, the, the concept of if they do have children, they're probably going to have less children, they're probably going to have them older. And the other, the, the big difference is we're, we're used to apartment living much more than my parents were or, yes. or the baby boomers were. Yeah. So doing it with children is something that you know, 15 years ago was you'd never do that, where yeah. people actually yeah. do do that with children mm -hmm. now. Maybe not with four or five in a small apartment, yeah, but, but with, more likely to be able to actually do it. With 1.34, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're likely, likely to have a go. Yeah. So what does that mean for developers in terms of what is built now for this next stage, in terms of common property and facilities? I think it just 
largely means a, a, a re-looking at what they actually provide. Yeah. Uh, you know, having enough open space and things for children to actually play and, and yeah. things, you know, play areas for children as opposed to the past where it was always just a pool and a gym mm. and that was about mm. it. A pool and a gym and, and regulations that in fact say children can't use common, <laughs> which, <laughs> yeah, right. which I always thought highly discriminatory myself, but mm. um, nevertheless yeah. uh, a feature of even the model rules in New South Wales. Mm. And, and things they just might need to provide instead, I suppose, going forward so that if, if with two children people do start living in apartment blocks more, which I think they already are, um, they're going to be more attracted potentially to something that has facilities for them to actually play on play equipment mm. for a period of time. Yeah, yeah. Some indoor child friendly facilities, as yeah. you say, a child care centre nearby somewhere would also yeah. be very useful. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I understand the Americans actually call the concept multi-family housing. Mm. Um, which is an interesting use of terminology and mm. terminology which we haven't seen catch on in Australia. But, but certainly, um, I would have thought the the emergence of of um, multifamily housing in America um, really puts paid to the suggestions in the Biz Shrapnel report um, that all of a sudden people are going to want to go back to the, mm. the to the freestanding house with the white picket fence um, rather than look for a bigger apartment or an apartment with more facilities and, and something for the kids to actually do. Useful things like basketball hoops and, yeah. and, and things like that that, that kids want to play on. Mm. I, I also think if, if we compared how many, um, if we just correlate this to say office blocks and, and office um, buildings, if you look 20 years ago at how many had facilities for childcare or for anything like that, there's a lot less then than there probably is now and that space has changed or had to change and I guess the apartment space may need to take a bit of suit on that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? Commercial buildings often provided their uh, workers with car parks, now there's more for areas to store your bikes and, and shower facilities, so certainly times do change. I, um, I was at a community consultation in the inner west on Sunday actually, and um, the developer there, in answer to problems about increasing density and the problems that that will cause for Parramatta Road, is actually giving each apartment buyer a free bike with the unit. So um, <laughs> the, the cynical crowd that I was um, addressing uh, thought, thought that was a bit laughable, but interesting to see mm. um, the response of the ever um, nimble marketers uh, to pick up on, on the need for that sort of thing. I also went and had a look at the last uh, the four year, last I think four years of jobs that we've done within BMT, thinking we always work for investors, and the percentage between houses and units never changed by more than one percent um, from the last four years. It was you know I think 56 and 57 percent houses, and the rest units for investors in this country, and the percentage between them in our jobs was exactly the same almost for the last four years. Well, let's just have a quick look at our first email, which comes from Amy. And Amy is looking at purchasing an investment property in Lynbrook. Hi, panel. I'm looking at buying our third investment property, this time in Lynbrook, which is already 13 years old. Just wondering if I can still get depreciation from this house, which has not yet had any renovations done. Thanks, Amy. Well, Brad, that looks like it's one for you. <laughs> It does, uh, and thanks for the question, Amy. It's a, it's a common question that, that people do ask on older properties. Older properties still get depreciation, pretty much no matter what age they are. But being only, I'll say, only 13 years old, it, it means that you still get to claim a part of that building that you get at 2.5% per year, or the construction cost. So it's actually much more su substantial if it's been built after a date in 987, for example, which obviously this one falls within. Something out there. I had a look at the prices of, um, or, the, or the median price out there. It's, a, it's in the early 400s. Something in the early 400s at 13 years old. You'll probably see sort of six or seven thousand dollars a year in deduction. Now, if that property was new at 400, you might see nine or ten. But at 13 years old, at six or seven, or you know, five to seven versus nine to 11, let's say, um, it's still quite substantial mm -hmm. and not, and still get some dollars out of it, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. Peter. Well, I, look, I, I would certainly get a, a, a depreciation schedule done. Um, I certainly encourage all of my students to get depreciation schedules done. Virtually it doesn't matter what age the property is because even though it might be a very old home, the kitchen may not be all that old or the bathroom may not be all that old or the, the uh, veranda that they build out the back. So there's plenty of opportunity there for depreciation. Good. Thanks, Peter. Well, this week we continue with our question of the week, which is your chance to get hold of one of Margaret's books. The panel and I will choose one question from either the emails or the calls and send that person a copy of Margaret's book, Investing in the Right Property Now. 
In this book, Margaret deals with the cash flow versus growth myth to help you become a better investor in today's market. All you have to do is call or email and make sure you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the winner. It's time for us now to take our first short break, but stay with us. After the break, the panel and I will be taking more calls and answering more of your emails. Welcome back. I'm Michael Tees and I have with me in the studio Peter Kalousis from Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT. We're standing by to take your calls about property investing. All you have to do is dial 1300 30 34 35 or of course you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Well, our second email for the week is from Michael and Michael's looking for some advice about a three bedroom townhouse in Coomera. Michael writes, Good evening panel. I have a three bedroom townhouse in Coomera and the return is not that good, about 3%. I've had it for nearly 10 years and the value has remained the same. It has been paid off. Should I sell and buy somewhere else? Asks Michael. Well Peter, um, let's start with you on this one. Um, firstly, let's talk about Coomera. Mm -hmm. what, do we, what do we think about Coomera? So Coomera, uh, inland from the Gold Coast, that my issue is there's a lot of supply possibility there. There's a lot of land that can be developed upon which you know, doesn't put a lot of pressure on, on price. I know we've got the Commonwealth Games coming to the, uh, the Gold Coast in the next few years, but its long-term impact might be huge on residential property. So, and, and the Gold Coast is a holiday market, and holiday markets have taken a hit all over the country because of the post-GFC. So I can't see the Gold Coast coming good for a while. That's, mm. that's my opinion. Mm. And um, it was interesting to hear Michael say that he's paid off the property, so it's, it's sitting there unencumbered. Mm. Um, there's obviously potential, Brad, for that to be held but borrowed against to springboard Michael into a more diversified property position if he decided to hold on to that asset. Uh, yes, I think that the concept of, of selling obviously comes with costs uh, and uh, using the equity that probably exists in that property to leverage into other property is one way to, I suppose, avoid those costs. However, if you don't think there's going to be any growth in that, you know, you haven't had it apparently in 10 years. Now, the, I had a bit of a look. I think the average growth for Kirma is like 6 or 7% for the last 10 years or close to that. And uh, does that mean you paid maybe a little bit too much at, for the, at the start? Because there was a lot of house and land package building going on over there in the last yeah. probably 10 years, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. But being able to use that equity, you've got some other financial... Obviously, but being able to pay it off, that's fantastic. You've got a lot of equity in there that's yeah. also dead and not being used for anything, yeah, I suppose. That's, that's no the leverage. tragedy of the situation, yeah. mm -hmm. isn't it? Whether, whether the property is sold or not, um, there's a lot of equity there to be, to be deployed. Um, what do we say about the Gold Coast where we have um, I think a lot of people looking towards the Commonwealth Games as some sort of panacea for um, problems that are existing in that market and have existed in that market for some time. I think it's overstated myself. Mm -hmm. um, any disagreement with me on that point? Uh, look, I'm a, I'm a bit with you. I think being um, uh, it's, it's, a one, it's one event that will bring some infrastructure and some spending etc but then after that event it's not there forever. And I don't think it's the saving grace towards an area. It's got to have fundamental long-term reasons why there's good things there as opposed to one event. Yeah, yeah. I think holding on to um, a two-week event, which I think on any view of things is a waning star, mm. um, is probably uh, uh, hopeful uh, yeah. thinking on the part of some marketeers. Yeah. Um, so really, Michael, for Coomera, um, perhaps you've, uh, you've paid over the odds, it looks, um, from the, the period of time that you've held that property and the, and the little growth you've had. Um, whether you stay or whether you go um, really depends on evaluating the, the cost of exiting that investment against the opportunities that present elsewhere. So take some good advice from people um, close to you on that and good luck with that investment decision. Our third email tonight comes to us from Steve who is looking at investing in a property in Wyala. Hi panel, I'm looking into investing in a rental property in Wyala, South Australia. I've been advised that it is a property hotspot due to mining and development. What are your views? Asks Steve. Well, uh, gentlemen, um, the property hotspot, I think it's a, um, a tag that um, I almost am sick of hearing about. Everything's got to be a hotspot these days or we don't do it. Mm. Um, hotspots focusing on mining. Towns, Peter, what are your thoughts? Oh, look, 
I have. I am from South Australia, and I have been to um, to Wyala because uh, a number of my students and some of my lecturers have actually bought there. So. Uh, I, I like Wyala. There's a lot of activity going on, mining activity, but it's not just mining. My problem with mining activity is if the mine goes, then what's plan B? And we've seen plenty of mining towns that are nowhere near what they used to be. For example, Broken Hill used to be a thriving metropolis. Now it's dead. Cobar, same thing. So uh, I, I like Wyala because it's not just one driver there. There is mining, there is manufacturing, uh, there is the agriculture in the surrounding area. Yeah, I, I do like Wyala. But of, of those various things that are happening in Wyala, is mining the dominant force? Well, I'm not familiar with Wyala. Wyala is, was a BHP town mm -hmm. and, and then uh, changed its name to One Steel and now it's Arium. So there is still a big employer in the yeah. town, still a lot of iron ore in and around Wyala. Um, so it's certainly heavily dependent on mining. And if the iron ore price is great, things are going well. If the iron ore price is not going so well, then it, it can be a problem. But unlike other mining towns, Wyala has other capital growth drivers. Brad, you're um, an active property investor yourself as well as um, your professional role as a depreciation consultant. Do you own any property yourself in mining towns? No, I don't actually, Michael. And, and uh, I've been a bit, uh, I, I guess, my, my thoughts on mining towns are similar to you in a lot of ways where being heavily focused on mining, as you say, there's other drivers in Wyala and not just mining. It's always associated with a bit of risk in relation to the fact that um, if there's something going on with mining, if China loses, well, they tell us China's going to lose its quest for steel, but um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But if it does, in any way, it's a higher risk. I think as part of a balanced portfolio, I wouldn't have a problem with having some of that in mining towns to punt. It's almost a punt. So the yeah. fact that I called it a punt might be a little bit of a problem, That's I suppose. That's the giveaway. That's the <laughs> um, yeah, which, you know, I'm not at the casino, though, <laughs> no, quite. No. Um, I think that uh, if it was my first, I'd be steering into some more fundamentals. So you think it might be, might be one for the more experienced, the more diversified investor? As part of the portfolio, As part yeah. of the portfolio. And, and what sort of premium, gentlemen, do you think you need to justify um, a decision with a little bit of risk associated, like a mining town? What's, what's, what's the, the overage that we're looking for? I guess I, I, I don't know if I really have a number on that, Michael, other than the fact that I want some sort of combination of some quite solid cash flow so that I'm getting ahead, some, some potential for growth, some things I can see that both are really higher than what I can see in other, in other things that have got other fundamentals that are going to hold it up if something goes wrong. Mm. I had an interesting discussion with a client last week and they done bought a few properties in the mining area and they'd gone so well they kept leveraging them up again mm. and then went a little bit pear-shaped in that area and and they're kind of stuck now they can't That's sell the ones that didn't work and the board and tried to strata and it's quite difficult too much of a good thing yeah. yeah peter do you have a benchmark where you're well, looking for um returns on those types of properties a bit like brad if you can get better than average rental yields better than average forecast capital growth the beauty about Wyala is it doesn't have the prices of a Caratha or a Gladstone. An average three-bedroom home is going to cost you $150,000. Right. So it's pretty hard to go wrong. So you can play there without that's huge, right. without risking huge amounts yeah. of risk. Well, that's good to know. So, yeah. look, I hope those, uh, those comments help you, Steve, with that decision to invest in a mining town. But remember always to ask the 20 questions that Margaret writes about in her books uh, to get a, a holistic view of the town and to see exactly what's happening there. Um, to give you some, some comfort if something does go wrong with mining. Well, um, thanks for tuning in so far. We've been taking some great emails and are about a third of the way through the show. But there's still plenty of time to call us with any questions you might have. Remember, the question of the week will receive a copy of one of Margaret's most popular property investing books. So call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at property at skynews com.au. For now, it's time to take a short break. We'll be back soon. Welcome back. I'm Michael Tees, and you're watching the property edition of Your Money, Your Call, where the panel and I answer your questions on property investing. Tonight, you'll be talking to Peter Kalisis from The Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT and I can also answer your strata property and legal questions. So call us on 1300 30 34 35 
or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Well, our next question comes from Craig, and uh, Craig's email reads, Dear panel, I have several properties, and I'm always looking for properties with good yields. I've recently come across properties in Sydney and Melbourne, which are run by Unilodge for student accommodation. These properties have very high yields, so I guess the capital gain will be smaller. But I'm wondering if you think there are other risks I'm unaware of. Regards, Craig. Well, gentlemen, um, apart from the obvious warning to Craig um, that I should give as a father of two um, university-aged children that any property investment which involves <laughs> um, university-aged children is uh, a tough one, um, what advice would we have for somebody investing in this specialist asset class? Peter, let's start with you. Uh, my issue is there's no plan B. I mean, I don't have a problem with people renting out, say, a house, a student accommodation rented out per bedroom, very good cash flow. And if, as I have found, because I teach at uni, our international student numbers aren't as good as they used to be because the Aussie dollar is very high, mm -hmm. our visa requirements have changed, so it's not like you get a degree and you automatically get permanent residency. So if you had, student, uh, if you had purpose built student accommodation, you have no plan B. If mm -hmm. the student market uh, lessens, then you've got a lesser chance of getting a, a, a tenant mm -hmm. and then obviously uh, lower cash flow. So I, I do have a big issue with those purpose-built properties, in particular student accommodation. So let's be clear about this. Pur by purpose-built, you mean built for a university, yeah. badged as, a, as a, um, almost a university hotel, if you yeah. like, um, where there are services offered and it's not in a normal residential class two type building. And, and it's not just me. If you try and borrow money to buy one of those student apartments, the bank uh, will ask for a higher loan to value ratio. And if it's less than 50 square metres, then good luck getting There was a, loan. a time when the developers of that property, that type of property, were building dual key apartments mm -hmm. or, or, or apartments even that might, might take six students. Is that still happening? Or yeah, well, certainly a number of the students in my class live in, in uh, those sorts of apartments. You're from Adelaide? Yep. Yeah. So uh, they, there might be four or five bedrooms, but all serviced by the one common kitchen and maybe a couple of bathrooms. So right. there, are, there are still those sorts of apartments. And certainly Adelaide had a big pitch for that student market. Is that, um, is that coming off the boil yeah, a bit? Uh, well, it, it certainly has come off the boil like it has around the country, but Adelaide appeals to international students, one, because it's cheaper for your child to live in Adelaide than it, it is, say, in Melbourne or Sydney. Mm. And two, the degrees are slightly cheaper in Adelaide. And since the GFC, that's, that's had a huge impact, mm. in particular on the Asian families. Mm. But generally, nationwide, we have less international students coming in. And um, Brad, what about depreciation on student accommodation? It's kind of like a hotel. It's run like a hotel. Are there 4% um, depreciation breaks available to investors in that stock? Not for individual investors on that stock. The rules are very much the same uh, as they are for a residential investor in property. So uh, the fact that it's being used for, for student accommodation means it's probably going to get a little bit more wear and tear than, mm. than, uh, than your mum and dad, I suppose, living in there. Although then sometimes they have kids and they draw on walls and things, however. There's probably a little bit more partying going on and there's probably a bit more wear and tear. And you don't, there's no allowance extra for that in that. They still get okay deductions from a depreciation point of view because a lot of them especially if they're purpose built they're actually new so they get um, they get better dollars and especially in comparison to what you sort of pay for them because you're buying they don't have much of a land component so you're buying a lot of construction cost um, I think that the, the, the biggest drama I have with the, with that concept is around what you've who you've got to sell it to afterwards I suppose which hurts your valuation yeah. Yeah. is the is the cash flow return enough as part of a balanced portfolio of property to have one of the two of those here or there, yeah. I guess it could be, it but could it's still be. fraught with um, potential yeah. some, some problem there with evaluations. And I'd add two matters from a legal perspective. Firstly, with student accommodation, there's always the issue of how the income is going to be distributed. So if the income is being pooled, um, then it's probably going to need a prospectus or a product disclosure statement, and ASIC will want to be involved in the regulation of the investment. Anything that doesn't meet that criteria is likely to be an unregistered uh, or a non-compliant managed investment scheme, and that runs a risk for investors 
being wound up on that basis. Secondly, I think it's really important to have a look at the zoning and the proper classification of the building to make sure that the building is in an appropriate classification that enables services of the type being provided by a hotel provider uh, to be given. If that turns it into a commercial property being run in a residential setting, then there could be problems from a building licensing point of view. So there are two legal issues uh, to look at, in addition to the other points that, that Peter and Brad have made about this specialist type of investing. Well, our first caller tonight is on the line, Damien. Damien, you're from Sydney, and uh, you have a question for us on investing in a new estate. Yes, that's right. Uh, Griffith, the new estate is 50 blocks um, ready to be released. Mm -hmm. um, looking around about the 400, for 400,000 for the uh, three bedroom, and there's also a six bedroom. They've indicated that it is again um, uh, close to the university, and so the, the university will drive it. Right, and so this is in New South Wales, is it? In Sydney? Yeah, Griffith. Griffith, Griffith in Queensland, is it? Or Griffith uh, in... No, New South Wales. Oh, sorry, I was getting confused with the Griffith yeah. University in Queensland. Okay, so this is Griffith in New South Wales, gentlemen. Um, so uh, some house and land, looks like a variety of sizes, uh, with a bit of a, a, a spin there on, on the university as a potential tenant. Peter, how would you uh, advise well, Damien? Gr the beauty about Griffith is it has other capital growth drivers other than the, the uh, university. What you need to be careful of is how many buildings are they planning to build uh, basically for the university because if, if price is a function of demand and supply and they just continue to increase supply then what's going to keep up uh, the value of your property if there are lots more coming on stream uh, in, in years to come. So just, just be wary of that. Maybe speak to the council and find out what their plans are for the release of new land. Brad. And uh, look, I, I think being Griffith, I'm not as familiar with, the, I suppose, the requirements for the number of um, students but to be housed there going forward. They usually, I've got some property that are houses in student areas, sort of around student areas. And I mean, the one thing I do, do do is I try to make sure my leases do finish around the time when uni goes back because it just, even though I don't necessarily have the students, it just puts pressure on the market. It gives me more of an option of who I actually get to take in my property because they're putting the pressure on it for everybody else. The fact that you're actually buying a house um, is probably a, got some positive to it because it's actually usable not just for students uh, and, 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 and normal people, normal people uh, as in um, <laughs> normal renters as opposed to students can potentially use the house. But as long as, there's, as long as there's some demand, I suppose, across the board and, yes, I guess also not heaps of land release coming up um, in the near future, then you're going to have potentially some demand and, and hopefully, yeah. hopefully some, uh, some returns on that. Damien, circumstances might indeed be the, the correct answer to the, the point we were making before about being wary of, of purpose-built mm. student accommodation. So good luck with that, Damien. Thanks for all of your questions so far. It's time again for another short break, but we'll be back. Remember, you could receive a copy of one of Margaret's most popular books just by asking the question of the week now on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Michael Tees, and with me on the panel tonight are Peter Kulizos from Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT. There's still time left for you to call and ask us any questions about property investing and perhaps receive the book of the week. The number is 1300 30 34 35, or you can email us on, at property at skynews.com.au. Now, uh, we have Scott on the line. Scott, you're from Sydney, and uh, you're looking at an investment in Brisbane. Is that right? That's right. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. How about you guys? Good. Tell us what you're on about. Um, I was just looking at um, the Newstead area, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm not really very familiar with Brisbane at all, but um, seems like there's a lot of stuff being built, but also quite a lot of momentum in the area, and just want, wondered what you guys thought. Well, the first thing you should know about Newstead is that my um, my 
nephew has just opened the best new coffee shop in Brisbane called Flick and Bean, and uh, you can get that uh, quite near where you're thinking of investing. So there's a plug for Tim. Now, let's talk about property. Newstead, gentlemen. Newstead, nice and close in yeah. Brisbane. Yeah, um, I, I do like Newstead. It's, it's uh, relatively close to the CBD uh, and to the river, so the location is right. Uh, you, are you looking to buy an apartment? Uh, yes. The problem that I have with apartments is there's a, almost an endless supply of high-rise apartments going up along the river, including Newstead, so you just want to be careful. Again, as I mentioned to the previous caller, if price of property is a function of the demand and supply for it, and supply continues to increase, then where's the pressure on your property uh, to keep its value? So just be very careful of that. Brian? Yeah, that's my concern too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and Scott, uh, my favourite little breakfast spot is actually in, in Newstead as well, which is quite interesting. So, which is possibly a good thing as far as uh, um, I, I guess it being a little bit more hip and cafes that yeah, people actually want to live there. Yeah. Um, now, we, we we're talking about the demographics of age of people and apartments, and will or will early in the show will will not they they move into apartments and stay in those apartments and if the apartments are built so they can have a couple of children in them then you know they want to live near the the, the cafes and things that uh, and so do I so I can get my coffee yeah. um, so I'm not as uh, necessarily as, as negative in on, on that area in Brisbane but yes there is quite a few apartments going there at the moment yeah I think if you look at Brisbane as a whole I'd agree with yeah. Peter there's, a, there's apartments in all sorts of places on the river some of which um, um, are, are particularly uh, fraught with difficulties mm. because of the flooding and, mm. and, and putting electrical services in basements which are actually below the water plane. But that apart, uh, that aside, I think Newstead's more, more interesting because Newstead's got that, that lovely heritage feel yes. about it. It's got the, the wool stores, yep. um, James Street there in the valley has sort of really added some panache, I think, to, mm. the, to the Brisbane CBD living experience. So, so I'm a fan of Newstead. I think it's really got lots going for it. And um, it, it's an interesting place to live, as opposed to you know, perhaps other um, CBD or fringe CBD um, places that we might think of around Australia where there's just sterile apartment after sterile apartment and, and the streetscape and the urban um, life hasn't yet um, developed. I think Newstead's uh, different to that. I think it's, it's got uh, some medium rise, some low rise, some high rise. I think they've done a good job. And uh, credit to... Um, uh, to the Urban Renewal Authority there that I think has done a wonderful job with um, Fortitude Valley in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I hope that helps you uh, with uh, those, those comments. Now, we've got a, another caller on the line, Eric. Eric, you're from Sydney also. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Look, the, the question I have, look, it's in the Blue Mountains in Katoomba. Mm -hmm. It's about 500 metres from the train station. It has been on the market off and on for about five years. It's a three-bedroom townhouse. The problem is it occupies, and I figure about a land value of around about seventy-five thousand. To rebuild, it costs around about two hundred thousand. So I figure about two seventy-five. They've had the they've had the property on the market off and on for about three hundred and fifty thousand. Am I correct in thinking? Do you invest in the land value? You have a low land value component with a high depreciating asset on it. Just am I correct in that thought? Thanks, fellas. All right. Thanks very much for that question. Um, we'll start with you, Brad, on that. See. At 300, uh, I think across, um, especially, and, and leaving just Katoomba out of this, but the city market, let's say Western Sydney, over the last few years, the, the cost of construction has gone up substantially over the last, let's say, 10 or longer. It's gone up substantially with proper, property markets being a bit slow in a lot of those areas. You could often buy things that actually stack or riders go, I couldn't actually buy the piece of land and build this because the, mm. a lot of that's about the infrastructure charges that you need to pay to our hungry councils these days mm. in order to actually get something off the ground. So you're not necessarily always, but you're not necessarily always going to, if you add up what you think construction cost is and the land value is, get to where your purchase price is and developers at the end of the day do have to make some sort of profit. But value is there often because of the fact that construction costs or development costs are actually so high. Uh, and, and therefore that makes it not necessarily a bad, a bad thing. Mm. It's been on the market for a long time, so that makes you question, is it overpriced and are you paying more than, than maybe you need to because no one else has bought it. And if it was a real bargain, then someone may have had some sort of interest in that. Um, and maybe that's a negotiating tool for you because it actually has been there for some time. Mm. It's a story in the paper in the weekend with a, with, a, with a guy who's held onto his house and been to three or four different auctions and it's just overs and he's going, I think it's worth that. And it could be one of those sort of situations <laughs> that I think you've always got to ask yourself. 
What about you, Peter? I, I like the fact that it's only 500 metres from the train station, but did you say it's been on the market on and off for five years? Yeah. That was, that was what Eric thought. That, that, yeah. that is a long time. A long so time. there must be something intrinsically wrong with the property yeah. uh, or that the owner has no real intention of selling it because surely it can't be overpriced for five years. Yeah, you'd think not. Mm. All right, well, um, good luck with that. The Blue Mountains has certainly um, been the beneficiary of some great infrastructure spending of late. Uh, there's a lot happening there. That road is still under construction um, but uh, nearing completion so uh, we'll provide a, a better run to the Blue Mountains in the not too distant future. So uh, thanks for tuning in so far. We've been taking some great emails but there's still plenty of time that you can call us with any question you might have. Remember the question of the week will receive a copy of one of Margaret's most popular property investing books. So do call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at property at skynews.com.au. For now, it's time for a short break. We'll be back soon. Welcome back. I'm Michael Tees, and I have with me in the studio Peter Kalisas from The Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT. We're standing by to take your calls about property investing. Please call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Our next caller is Bob from northern New South Wales. Hi, Bob. How are you? Yeah, hi, Michael, Peter and Brad. Um, yeah, recently put in an offer on, a, uh, on an apartment uh, in, on the northern suburbs in Brisbane. Um, the results have come back from a couple of inspections uh, from um, pest and building not particularly favourable, but not enough to put me off uh, pursuing further. Um, just wondering what my options are in revising down an offer originally submitted. Uh, the agents indicated that they're not particularly keen to take a lower offer than what I've already submitted. Yeah, well, um, that I suppose is not surprising, Bob, given that agents work for vendors and not for you as the purchaser. Um, I'll start the discussion off by saying I bet if you had a purchaser's uh, buyer's agent working for you, uh, there'd be a renegotiation on uh, over the uh, report details. Uh, but those comments uh, made, Peter, what do you think about... Uh, uh, Bob, do you have Bob's a guide situation? as to how much it's going to cost to fix up the pest problem or the building problem? Um, I haven't got, haven't got figures, to be honest, but I'm probably looking at, you know, maybe, you know, five or ten grand. It's only a stab in the dark, but it's just... Uh, you know, an uneducated guest, to be honest. Well, maybe if you could get those figures mm. quantified, I'd have no problem in going back to the agent and saying, look, you know, there's ten or $15,000 worth of work here. I'm happy to buy it, providing the price is dropped by ten or $15,000. I certainly encourage my students to negotiate if they get a building inspection and if they've got quantifiable costs there. I see nothing wrong with bringing down the original asking price by at least that amount. Brad, what do you say? Yeah, Bob, and this is going to be a negotiation process for you, uh, getting an idea of what you think it will actually cost, maybe a more detailed idea of the cost of actually repairing these things is something I would also suggest. At the end of the day, the owner um, has a choice to either accept an offer from you or not accept an offer from you. The fact that you think it's got money to spend to fix it, if someone else will come and buy it at the full mar asking price, then they'll still sell it to them, I suppose, instead. Is ten or fifteen thousand or whatever? If it's ten thousand dollars, is ten thousand dollars the difference in whether or not you think this thing stacks or doesn't stack? And that's a question you've got to ask yourself. Maybe you go and negotiate and say, I want some of that money off rather than the whole lot, and say, Well, anyone else is going to this is going to pop up in a pest and building report as well, and just negotiate a little bit at least to get some way towards where I think uh, where you think it might be. And Bob, I'd add this that um, certainly when buying into apartments. Um, be very careful about the building inspection report. Make sure the building inspection report has had a good look at the common property as well as the, the particular apartment that you're buying because you have a share of that for better or for worse. Um, most buildings that we're seeing built these days leak. Um, it's a sad indictment on the building um, disciplines but that's the truth and the inspection reports will not always provide the answer. The answer might be found in the strata inspection report. So get an inspection done of the strata records and there look for people talking about common issues that are yet to be addressed by the body corporate. And certainly if you were to find anything there then I think you've got better bargaining chips and uh, you might be able to really get the price that you want 
uh, to pay for that property. So good luck with that, and uh, don't be afraid to let us know how you get on. Um, we've got a caller now, Bruce from Gladstone. Uh, Bruce, you're from Tannum Sands, I understand, and you're thinking of renovating your Sydney property. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, well, I've got a, I'm actually living in my house in Tannum Sands, and I've got a bit of dilemma, sort of, because uh, there's a mining boom here. I was thinking to put my money into my investment property in Tannum Sands, mm -hmm. but also I have an investment property in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had that property for six years as a rental, and that's my principal house of residence. So is it better for me to put the money in the house in Sydney or the house in Tatham Sands where the, the property is actually booming there at the moment? Okay, all right. Well, we'll start with Brad, and then I'm sure Peter's going to have some views about the strategy to use on that investment as well. So, Bruce, you're just really trying to decide, decide whether you'll renovate Sydney or Tatham Sands, and I guess uh, is what I, what I gather by that. And I, and I guess where I would spend my money is where I'm going to make the most out of it is, the, is really the answer to that. If the Tenham Sands property is going to have the growth without spending the money and the capital improvements, then, uh, then I'd, I'd, be, I'd be leaning towards the other. If you believe the improvement that you make on the Sydney for the amount of money that you do spend is going to increase the value by a better percentage, I'm, I'd put it wherever we're going to actually make the most money out of it, I suppose. So if I spend X here or X there, what does the end result look like? Market aside, either of them are going to end up with some sort of number. Um, the market's still, still going to do its thing either way, and we're going to get the actual best return out of it. Well, you, did, you did throw in that you're living potentially in here or there, and then you've also got to think of if you're actually living in the house, you might want a nice house uh, as well. So that um, really messes it up as not necessarily only an investment decision as well, in my thoughts. It, uh, Peter, it sounds like Bruce might um, be in a really good position of having an investment property in perhaps the best two markets in Australia yeah. at the moment, yeah. um, Sydney and um, anything around Gladstone. So uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, very story? similar to Brad's. You know, work out if you spend, let's say, thirty or $40,000 on the property in Tannum Sands, how much is that going to increase the rent by? How much is that going to increase the value by? Uh, and then also have a look at if you spend that same money on your property in Sydney, what's that going to increase the value by? But there's also a lifestyle decision to be made here. So is lifestyle more important to you? Like you might be thinking of spending thirty or $40,000 on a deck which gives you uh, lovely views, uh, or is the cash flow uh, more important? So work out what's more important to you and that'll help decide which property you spend the money on. All right. Well, thanks very much for those thoughts, gentlemen. And uh, our next caller is Steve from Newcastle. Hi, Steve. How are you? Hi. How are you going, panel? Very good, thanks. Um, I just want to ask the panel if they're familiar with the changes in the New South Wales State Government uh, planning development laws that, 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 that are coming up. Um, I, I noticed the media report on it last week and um, there was seemed to be a bit of concern in that report and I was just wondering if anyone on the panel were, were, had done any research and were familiar with the changes and whether they're going to make any impact. And what specifically is your concern there? Oh, well, just to, uh, it mentioned about um, neighbours not being consulted um, and all that sort of thing and, um, in, re in regards to developments and yeah. fast-tracking developments. And you know, I, I have a, uh, some rental properties myself and, and also just wondering how I might be able to benefit. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, what do we think about the New South Wales government's planning law uh, review that's much spoken of at the moment in the media? Well, I think under the I, I think under the current the current situation, we end up with development being stifled pretty badly in New South Wales by the fact that, firstly, well, infrastructure costs are high, but then the amount of trying to get from A to Z in in actually developing or infill planning in any way in in development in New South Wales, it gets held up by too many things. We have some rules. If we if we actually suit a percentage of those rules or all of those rules, 100%. Um, uh, when we buy a property in an area, we should probably look at those rules mm. rather than going back later and saying, well, I actually no longer like these rules mm. and therefore I want to you know, get involved in this process. Now, the fact is it ends up taking a long, long time for any development that actually goes ahead, so it stifles development from happening in New South Wales, which creates more of a lack of supply of property. In saying that, when you live in a house, sometimes the, the, the rules, when they do change, that's not really all that fair either um, because you, you don't want to have people looking into your backyard. Uh, and so there's a, there's, I think the, uh, the resident has to have some sort of voice in what 
what high-rise gets built in his backyard. And there's got to be some balance in between that. And I think we just struggle to get it right, Steve, and I don't know if this is necessarily going to fix that problem. You're sounding like a fence-sitting politician, right? <laughs> are, you announcing, are you announcing your candidacy for something? You don't know? Peter, um, what, what views do you have about these new laws? Um, look, I don't know uh, the specifics of the New South Wales new uh, property planning laws, but I do know that this move is happening nationally where uh, state governments and local councils want to fast track the process because as Brad was saying before that there is a huge bottleneck and, and with, with the process that, needs to, that, the, uh, that the planning approval needs to go through and the red tape, often things don't happen because if you buy a block of land and you're waiting months or years there's, there's holding costs involved there. So with a bit more certainty in the planning laws then that should help provide some new infrastructure and some new buildings. But my understanding of the, of the New South Wales planning laws is let's get it done quicker. Let's streamline the process. And I think there's a risk here. Where I think we've suffered from um, stifling laws for so long that we're all very anxious for a new beginning. But there is a risk that the O'Farrell government is a little bit too kind to developers. We're seeing that in the strata title area at the moment. We're seeing it in the home building warranty uh, area at the moment. So I think be careful um, that we don't get too, uh, too far the other way and, uh, and throw out all of the checks and balances that provide for a better urban development. So I just think there's a little bit of caution needed by this government um, that we're not too pro-development um, answering for the, uh, for the inactivity of the past. Well look, thanks for your questions so far. It's time for another short break, but we'll be back soon. Remember you could receive a copy of one of Margaret's most popular books investing in the right property now by asking the question of the week on 1300 30 34 35 or emailing us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back, I'm Michael Tees and you're watching the property edition of Your Money, Your Call where the panel and I answer your questions on property investing. Tonight you'll be speaking with Peter Kalisis, the property professor, and Brad Beer from BMT, and I can also answer any strata title questions that you have. So call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Our next caller is Adam, and Adam, you're calling from Sydney with some questions about depreciation and land tax, our favourite two topics tonight. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you for taking the call, Michael. Um, this first question is probably most likely for Brad. Uh, it's just I'll, just, I'll decide that. Hey? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my job, Adam. Huh? Yeah. Uh, it's just in regards to a house that we've um, recently bought that um, had quite a lot of furniture that was left in there, and we got a depreciation schedule done against it with everything in there. Um, but I'm just, the tenants that are looking to move in don't want any of the furniture, so I'm just understanding are there any options around scrapping that mm -hmm. uh, and getting a tax benefit for that? And the second question in regards to land tax, uh, another place we've got that we're looking at moving into as our, uh, it's, a, it's currently a rental, looking at moving in there to be a principal place of residence later in the year. If we move in before the end of the year, is there a, uh, a land tax liability for that? Well, thanks Thank for that. You. And having carefully considered your questions, I'm now going to direct them to Brad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. In regards to um, the, the, the depreciation on that furniture, when you've got a furnished property, obviously that's, that's great because it, great in respect to depreciation because it is plant and equipment and you do get to write it off fairly quickly. And when you dispose of um, items of plant and equipment after you've purchased them, then, uh, th then, then there's potential for scrapping. Yours is a little difficult because in order to scrap things or in order to claim depreciation against things, you should really have um, really have them uh, uh, used for income producing purposes and provide some income from these things. Yours, is a, yours gets a little bit grey because the fact was you did buy it in with the intention to rent it out and it does come down to your intention and then you've thrown it away and it's a little bit of a question that probably needs to, that needs to run back to the accountant a little bit with a bit further because it's a little bit risky if you want to claim that unless your intentions were exactly to do that. Intentions sometimes change. Um, when you buy things and then use them for something else, sometimes it can work, but they, for the amount, it may not be worth the risk, I guess is what I'm, what I'm going to say there. Yeah. Um, in relation, 
Yeah. On on land tax. In relation to the land tax, I think if you, uh, I all I I don't have a principal place of residence, so having changed them, from what I understand, I think there'll be a pro rata percentage for the percentage of the year that it, that you do actually have it as an investment property. And Michael, you any closer on the rules on that one? Uh, no. No. Well, I can only go by what happens in South Australia. Basically, they look at the situation on the 30th of June. So if you own it on the 30th of June and it's a rental property, you're liable for land tax. If you own it on the 30th of June and it's your principal place of residence, there is no land tax. But you know, New South Wales could be different. I'm yeah. not exactly Sorry, sure. Sorry, I can't that. help you with that. But the, uh, look, I think the, the, the question that we're talking about there gets very close to um, the giving of advice, and we should be very clear that we're not giving financial advice here. That's not the, pr the, the function of this show. We're answering uh, situations in a general way. Mm. And, and it really does make the point, I think Brad's um, answer to the question makes the point that with these things where questions of intent are important, then really is a case where you need to speak to your own accountant about um, what's going on there and there might be some particular advice that, that you need to follow about your circumstances that helps you with that. All right, well, we're almost out of time. Um, Margaret will be back in the chair next week when Curtis Field from Colliers and Lisa Montgomery from Resi will join her. Our question of the, of the week this week uh, came from Scott, who was from Sydney, but asked us a question about investing in Newstead in Brisbane. And I'll be sending you a copy of Investing in the Right Property Now. All you need to do, Scott, is email me your address at michael at teaslawyers.com.au and I'll make sure that you get that book. Thank you to our guests Peter Kalisis from The Property Professor and Brad Beer from BMT. If you live in Melbourne, tomorrow night I'll be conducting a seminar on the implications of short-term letting in residential buildings following a recent uh, case called Watergate, which we've won in Melbourne, which uh, will close down uh, short-term apartment service departments in Class 2 buildings. You can get the details of this free seminar on my website, teaslawyers.com.au. And don't forget, you can follow me daily on Twitter at Michael Tees. Margaret will be back in the seat next week and you can catch us on Saturday for another edition of Property Success, first screening at 9am and then repeated throughout the day. Thanks for being with us. I'm Michael Tees. Until next time, good night. Mm -hmm.